Distributions and dispersions. What determines the presence or absence of an animal or plant and where it lives, and how are they going to be dispersed within that distribution? So in this lecture, uh, you want to define niche, distribution, dispersion, and gradient. We'll be coming back to niche several times. So please be sure to relate niche and distribution to the um, earlier lectures on temperature relations and water relations, i.e. organismal ecology. Be able to differentiate between fundamental and realized niches. Know that that's going to come up a few times, so that's kind of a key thing to get. And list and compare the three basic dispersion patterns, giving causes and examples of and for each. And compare small and large scale spatial patterns. So what's large, what's small? Well, that really depends on the organism. There's a difference between a bacteria and an elephant. So distribution. What physiological limits are actually restraining the geographic expansion of a species? So take, for example, uh, Douglas fir, Pseudosuga menziesii. So Pseudosuga menziesii is actually two separate subspecies there. And there's the green one, which is the one we're all familiar with, the Douglas fir that we know and love so much, living on this side of the Cascade Mountains. And then there is a, an actual eastern variety of Douglas fir that can live as far south as New Mexico. So the physiological limits on these, well, if you think about it, there's a certain amount of moisture in the winters that Douglas fir needs. Cold, frozen winters are not good for this plant. Um, there's a certain amount of temperature that it can and cannot withstand. The temperature and the, the heat of the Los Angeles um, climate is simply too hot. <clears throat> and up north, it cannot live in, um, it cannot live in Alaska. So you see there are physiological limits related to temperature and precipitation that make it so it can't go in some places and can't go in others. There's also wind, of course. You can't grow Douglas fir in Nebraska because Douglas fir would be blown over. Remember, every time the wind seems to blow around here, you get a few branches sh shaken loose. Well, it's always windy there. It's always windy in eastern Wyoming. So these are spaces that are simply not suitable for Douglas fir. And then you have things like, uh, so that's, that's your basic physiology, really. Bison, bison are the American bison. It cannot live down in Chihuahua, New Mexico, and it does not do very well in New Brunswick, Canada. These are some things that are just limited. It's just limited to. Now, while it can live in the, um, in the wet lands in Georgia, so it can live in, you know, the moisture and humidity of Georgia, it cannot live in the moisture and humidity of Nevada. So there's some water relations. So this temperature and water relations are going to be things that determine where it can and cannot live. There are geographical limits too. So most species exhibit a, um, and most terrestrial species are going to live in a continuous terrestrial zone. So you're not going to see bison in France, unless you bring them there, which would be very confusing for the bison. I mean, they don't even speak French. You notice they're not in Quebec. So as you see, bison just, they, they, they aren't there because of geography. Now, if France were continuous with the United States, maybe they would migrate over, or maybe they would not if other physiological constraints existed. Distribution also depends on opportunities. The world is a changing place. The world has always been a changing place. 21,000 years ago, this was just a big old ice sheet called the Laurentide Ice Sheet, which covered Canada and most of the northern, um, northeastern United States. So this Laurentide Ice Sheet was an area that couldn't be lived, where spruce could not live, but spruce, by its physiology, could live in the Ozarks. It liked dry summers, but not like, too dry. And wet winters and springs. It likes cold winters and cooler summers. So cooler and dry summers, not something like, you know, 35 degrees Celsius and no rain for four weeks, uh, which it can get around here. And when you see that kind of weather here, you'll see spruce suffering because spruce does grow here. It just doesn't grow much here. Now, if you were to look at where it is growing, you'd look well to the north, of course, to the, um, the Canadian Shield. So you'll see that in the uh, in those northern provinces in eastern Canada, there's a lot of spruce. You also find it uh, very common in um, 
actually the east, the western coast of Alaska, you'll see spruce as well. And the ecology, this organismal ecology, the relation between water, water relations and temperature relations is going to determine where it is distributed. Also, the opportunities that are given to it based on the movement of ice sheets and the movement of, well, seeds, really. Now, there is a large scale distribution kind of pattern here. So I want you to kind of look at the large scale patterns where you have like the fish crow and the American crow. Now there's places where they can be breeding and they're permanent residents. There are places where they just go to breed. Now your fish crow here is um, it's a permanent resident in most of the eastern parts of the United States. Cool. It can live on, well, it can go up the uh, Nevada uh, Red River. So it can go up the Red River, it can go up the Arkansas River, and it can live up to uh, Manhattan. Your American crow, your um, common crow around here, too, is well, it's just pretty much everywhere. It just, just likes being there. There are places where it goes to breed, of course, just kind of flocks in and mates, goes back and does whatever it wants. Um, here, we'll actually see these crows gather, though, locally. They aren't evenly distributed through that. So if we actually looked at the crow and fish crow here, your American crow is more dense in some areas. Notice all of those crows in, uh, in Idaho. So those are Ida crows. And then you see the, the crows down in, uh, in Tennessee. I don't have a good pun for that. But there are crows also in Houston and crows in the middle of the country, um, Kansas, Kansas City. And we'll actually, we'll actually also see that sometimes they flock together in large murders. There's actually one that's been going around my neighborhood lately. And every day, it's a bigger group of crow. But that would be a dispersal question, or dispersion question, not a distribution question. The distribution, though, you see the fish crow is located, it's located anywhere along that range. But within the range, it's got a very high density in three areas. So... Organisms can be more or less common throughout their distribution. And we're also going to look at a moment here uh, for gradients. So gradients are from one physiological constraint to the other, really. So too cold to too hot, uh, too low to too high. And I do a lot of research along elevation gradients. So as we drive up a mountain, you'll see uh, the change in what is going to be living along that mountain. This is a eastern uh, mountainside. You have uh, eastern hemlock, which is very abundant on moist valley bottoms. Red maples are going to be mid-slope kind of trees. And then as you get up the tree, you get table mountain pines. But the table mountain pines are restricted by physiology, so they're not living on the low elevation. And the hemlocks are restricted by physiology, so they're not living on the high elevation. I'd love to just go on a hike up Mount Eleanor again. Uh, that was really fun. You can start actually at a Big Creek campground. Now, Big Creek campground is a salal, um, salal understory, you got some sword ferns, you've got some, um, what is it? you have some western hemlock, but you also have mostly Douglas fir and maple, so, and, and cedar. And as you actually go up Big Creek Campground hike, uh, Big Creek Loop, sorry, as you go up Big Creek Loop, you actually start to see uh, bear grass, and you start to see more hemlocks. You can actually go into this little niche in a mountain, and, um, you actually see a complete change in the forest as you just round this bend in a turn because you've you've gone into a, a little mountain valley where the moisture has changed. Now, there's a spur from the Big Creek Loop that goes up Mount Eleanor. And as you continue up Mount Eleanor, you lose the big leaf maple, you lose the cedars, and you start losing Douglas fir. You get more and more hemlock. You get fewer salal and more sword ferns. And then as you go even higher, the sword ferns start to drop out and you begin to find more bear grass, which lives in the same kind of area, just a higher elevation type of plants, actually a lily. Then the hemlocks disappear, you see a few spruce, and then the spruce disappear, and well, you're on the mountainside. So really up there at the top of the elevation gradient. So walking this, I think it's actually a total nine miles from Bear Creek, no, Big Creek, up to the top of Mount Eleanor, you can actually go all the way up there it's a complete change from one forest to an alpine area. And that's, if you were looking at geographical range, you'd say this is within the geographical range of Western hemlock and big, and big leaf maple, but they're only living on certain parts of the mountains. So even within a geographical range, we see these gradients. We also see rural to urban gradients. 
I said there's a lot of crows around here. Yes, and there aren't a lot of ravens. Ravens like more rural areas. Crows prefer more urban ones. Of course, we're familiar with latitude gradients. As we drive south to California, you'll see a change in, um, in what lives where. So you'll see a change in the, in the forests as we move down to, uh, down to Mexico, if you really want to take a long journey. There's also moisture gradients. So the relative moisture is actually in terms of what lives where, and those can be seen uh, pretty much everywhere. You know, even closer to a building and farther away from a building is actually a big moisture gradient. So this can be find, found on a rather small scale, and the distribution within that can be very tight. All right. This distribution depends on something called a niche. The niche is the suite of conditions and resources occupied and used by an organism. So think about Douglas fir as our example. We have, it prefers a certain type of temperature. So it likes cool, but not too cold winters, um, warm, but not too hot summers. If you were to have one axis there, you'd see that Douglas fir is found within a certain space on that axis. If you were to add a second axis for precipitation, Douglas fir prefers a certain range of precipitation. It cannot live in an area that's too dry, and it doesn't survive well in an area that's too wet. You get root rot. And Douglas fir's niche would be limited from um, very dry to very wet. So if you have two axes now, you could actually plot a certain sweet spot where we want to get Douglas fir in that niche. So I'm not going to draw that because of what I'm going to do next, which is add a third axis coming out of those two axes. And that third axis uh, would be wind. So you know, you're thinking, wait, temperature, precipitation, wind are all related. Yes, I'm keeping it easy at first. So too windy and Douglas fir won't survive there. So on certain wind blasted mountainsides, you're not going to find this tree as often as you find other species because it's not very wind resistant. Add to that the phosphate content in the soil as a fourth axis. So the phosphate content in the soil is going to limit where a Douglas fir can live too high and it's not going to be able to thrive. It's going to get outcompeted. Too low and it's not going to be able to live. It's going to get starved. So now we have four axes. We have temperature, precipitation, wind, and phosphate. Okay, and nitrogen content. So the amount of nitrogen in the soil is going to determine whether it lives or not. Too much nitrogen can actually make it drop its mycorrhizal uh, inhabitants, and that way, that way actually ends up losing water too. So five axes. Well, there are other axes too, like the presence or absence of gray squirrels. So eastern gray squirrels eat a lot of the seeds and reduce the fitness of Douglas fir trees. So now we have another axis, and another one, and another one. So this niche is really existing in um, multi-dimensional space and is specific to a species. Sometimes it can be specific to a subspecies like we saw with Douglas fir, where it has two subspecies, sometimes to a certain sex of a plant or an animal. So the males and the females may occupy different niches, sometimes to a specific life stage where the larvae and the adults may eat different things. You can break these down further. A fundamental niche is the range of conditions and resources an organism could occupy and use. So here we have Geospiza fortis, Fuluginosus, and Magna rostris. Now Geospiza fortis can eat a wide range of seeds. That's its fundamental niche. It can eat small seeds and big seeds depending on the seed size based on their, um, their how many millimeters you know, deep they are. Uh, the diet proportion you see in the presence of these other two species, Geospiza fortis only eats medium seeds, and that's its realized niche. Fundamental niche is what it can do. Realized niche is what it does when competing. When competitors are present, an organism occupies a reduced space on its niche. So in the presence of Geospiza filigonosa, which eats mainly small seeds, Geospiza fortis is not going to eat small seeds as efficiently as Filigonosa eats small seeds. So Geospiza fortis will eat primarily medium and large seeds. But in the presence of Geospiza magnorostris, which eats mainly large seeds, Geospiza fortis cannot eat large seeds as well as Geospiza magnorostris eats large seeds. Thus, Geospiza fortis will eat mainly medium seeds in the presence of both of these competitors. Remove a competitor, 
increase the realized niche, remove all competitors, resort to the fundamental niche. We can also look in terms of this as distribution and niches. The native range is where an organism lived before the advent of man. So before, uh, before Homo sapiens started kind of messing everything up, it was the native ranges only. Now, organisms did expand and contract their ranges. We can see that in such things as a Cambrian explosion, where there's a vast increase in range of certain organisms. Um, there's also the potential range where an organism could live if there were not competitors. So here we have uh, Solidago stasia. It's a blue stem golden arm. You'll find this in Tompkins County, New York, I know, because I lived there. But you won't find this in Wisconsin, because Wisconsin has different types of, uh, different types of plants that are going to compete with, with this uh, blue stem golden rod and be more efficient than this blue stem golden rod. Now, if you were to remove those competitors and introduce blue stem golden rod, it could live out in Wisconsin. Wisconsin? Wisconsin. Yes. So it can live in Wisconsin. Anyway, but it doesn't because of the competitors. And that's potential range. Now, the invasive range is where the organism could live if it was physically brought there. So there are seeds going from Chicago to Wisconsin. Dang it. <laughs> to Wisconsin. And uh, those seeds will go, but they won't germinate, they won't survive because they're uh, competing too much with other things. That's part of the potential range. Now, if humans actually brought uh, blue stem goldenrod out to Oregon, it could live here. If it was brought here, and that would be an invasive species. We're going to come back to invasive species a bit because that's kind of my, that's kind of my jam. Uh, so get to know this native range, potential range, and invasive range. So it's the presence and absence of competition determines native and potential range, and the invasive range is determined by the presence or absence of human intervention. Hmm, that's some good stuff. Let's finish it off today with dispersion. Here we have a pond. Now, there is... Uh, there's a range to the cattails, there's a range to the lily pads, and there's a range to the bass. Uh, this pond exists within the distributions for cattails, lily pads, and bass. It turns out that there is a pool of water here, and that is an abiotic factor that is going to allow lily pads, bass, and cattails to live here. There's also different depths of water and different temperatures of water. We're going to focus on depth here. And those, that's the abiotic factor that allows these three organisms to live in this pond. There are also biotic factors, so the presence and absence of competition, the presence and absence of herbivory, the presence and absence of um, seed dispersal units. Now, it turns out that bass, um, they're not seeds, but they have uh, their eggs can be dispersed by attaching to the feet of a duck, perhaps. Uh, dispersed soul is another lecture entirely, so we'll we'll get to that later. If we just skip over to that one if you want to, and then come back to this one. I don't care. Anyway, the cattails, the lily pads, and the bats are going to be dispersed differently around this pond, though. Our cattails are going to be on the edge of the pond. And what they're going to do is, since they actually grow and reproduce by kind of pushing each other out, they're going to uh, they're going to grow in these big clumps. So the cattails can be found in clumped dispersion. And that's going to mean, you know, you, just, you have a cattail here and it's reproducing clonally, so it's going to be a big cattail and you find all the stems in a clump. Now the lily pads, they're going to, they have to occupy a unit pond space. So well, we will find them in clumps because they also produce by rhizomes. They'll be relatively uniformly distributed. Um, each lily pad is going to occupy a certain amount of space. So the, um, the bats as well are going to occupy a certain amount of space. They're going to compete with one another, and that's going to be, lead to kind of a uniform dispersion as well. What about a random dispersion? Well, that really is going to depend on multiple factors, and we don't have a good example in this pond, but we can see is where these organisms exist in that pond is going to be determined by abiotic and biotic factors, as well as 
you know, produce their lifestyles. So how are they dispersed? Let's go first into those clumps. <laughs> Clumped. Aggregated into patches. Now this can be when, uh, this is very common dispersion. As I kind of showed, we had two out of the three that I kind of just chose were, uh, were clumped dispersions. So you have um, you have a clump of lily pads because they reproduce asexually. Now each lily pad occupies a uniform space, and we'll get to that, but um, asexual reproduction is a great cause of clumping in plants. There's also clumping around resources. So an oasis is a clump of palm trees. A, um, a herd of elephants is a social group of elephants and also a clump of elephants. Uh, you want to avoid being eaten by a lion? I uh, live in a clump of antelope or gazelles, eh, whatever. Anyway, live in a clump of those, and that grouping together is a tactic by these organisms to avoid predation. You can also find resources. Perhaps resources are resources generally aren't distributed uniformly within an ecosystem, and that leads to a clumping of the organisms that you that use those resources. So clump is very common. Uniform implies things. Each one of these is a certain distance away. Well, how far are seabirds distributed away from one another? They're distributed pecking distance. So, <clears throat> stay out of my zone. That's my zone. My zone is determined by how far <clears throat> I can peck another bird. Um, that's going to lead to uniform dispersion. Resources, if resources are evenly distributed, that can lead to a uniform dispersion as well. Defenses can lead to uniform dispersion. So. Um, living in a certain way that you're actually poisoning the soil around you to push everyone around. That's very similar to that competition. It's just defense, you know, territoriality. These are things that lead to uniform dispersion. Last, random. There just isn't a cause. It's just the, the, the seed falls, the plant grows. It's random. That kind of thing can be when, when resources are randomly but not randomly distributed within a population but not incredibly clumped. So this can just be when seeds fall on a lawn. It tends to make a random dispersion. And those are the three different types of dispersion. Pretty easy. Make sure you know the uh, the fundamental and realized niche and the distribution. So really where will you find an organism? It's determined by distributions which is determined by their niche which also determines their dispersion within that area.